Hello, everyone. I'm Sharon Epperson, CNBC Senior Personal Finance Correspondent. Every day I report on how people manage, grow, and protect their money. It is my passion, financial literacy and financial education. So I was really struck today by a new survey from Junior Achievement that shows that the majority of American teens do not believe that everyone is presented with a level playing field when it comes to achieving financial success. Now, why do they say this? Well, they believe it's because of two major reasons. First of all, education is not equal for everyone, they say. And the second reason is that there's a lack of understanding about how money, investing, and the economy works. So how can we fix this? Well, to start, we wanted to hear from teens directly. We wanted to hear what teens had to say, and that is why we are so proud to partner with Junior Achievement today. We're going to spend the next 60 minutes getting questions from teens and have them answered live by top experts in the financial industry. And we're going to find out how we can actually use education to help level the financial playing field. To start us off, I'm so excited to introduce Jack Kozakowski, who is the president and CEO of Junior Achievement. And Jack, we are so excited to be partnering with you on this very special event. Well, Sharon, thank you so much. And I tell you that we are very proud to partner with CNBC on this important event. Uh, this type of program is important anytime, but given all that's gone on during the past year, having a live interactive format for teens to be able to communicate with experts and get real-time answers is so critical to us. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the questions from the students uh, and seeing how all the panelists interact. So thank you very much. And thank you, CNBC. Absolutely. I'm ready too. I got my notes right here. I'm going to be taking notes as well because I know we're going to get a lot of insights from teens and from the experts, Jack. So it's going to be a great hour. Let me introduce right now our terrific panel. We have Jay Clayton, the former U.S. Chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commissioner. Commish, thank you very much for being here and joining us today. He is also a CNBC contributor, and you can read what he's written about financial education and financial literacy on cnbc.com. Really great op-ed that we have up on the site. And Dr. Lisa Cook, thank you for joining us, Professor of Economics and International Relations at Michigan State University. She also served on the White House Economic Advisors Council during the Obama administration. Dr. Cook, again, thank you for being here. Gorik Eng is a career advisor at Harvard and author of the book, The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right. In 2009, Gorik was named one of Time Magazine's top 25 future leaders from around the world. Awesome book and awesome to have you here, Gorik. Thank you. And finally, we have Natalie Molina Nino, who is a managing director at Known Holdings. She's also an investor, entrepreneur, and author of Leapfrog, the new revolution for women entrepreneurs. I love that one too. Many thanks to all of you for your expertise and your ideas to help students understand how we can level the financial playing field through education together. So we wanna jump right in and we have as our first teen asking a question is George Sanchez. He's 16 years old from Florida. He attends Jefferson High School and he's been active with junior achievement since elementary school. Jorge, thanks for being here. What is your question for our panel? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I send all of you a warm Florida welcome. And my question for the panel today is, in what way have you all seen financial illiteracy affect our ability to participate in life and participate in careers? Financial illiteracy, Jay, that's something that we're all trying to combat. And what would be your answer for Jorge? Well, Jorge, thank you for that. Wonderful question. And it's all about making decisions. And if you're not educated about our financial system, and in particular credit, how much credit costs, the value of investing, the cost of credit, you're likely to make bad decisions. And the, the biggest cost is compounding bad decisions. One bad decision, another bad decision. Pretty soon you've got yourself in a financial hole. On the other hand, good decisions, good decisions, you get yourself into a financial good position. So it, it, it just, it's one of those things that creates then a divide. The people who know how to make good decisions, they move up. The people who don't know how to make good decisions, they go down. And that's a real cost to society. It's an individual cost and a societal cost. 
Absolutely, Jay. I think it's so important that you said that it's all about decision making and that can be taught even in elementary school, right, Jorge? You learned a lot just in those early years, would you say? Yeah, I would say a lot. And I think it's important that you bring up like teaching like financial skills early on, like through the BizTown program that JA does, I was able to actually learn how to make money. And then through reinforcement through programs like JA Finance Park, I was actually able to learn how to budget that money. So it's it's been a long journey with personal financial literacy. And I think it's important that we take it a step further and try to lessen the gap of that financial illiteracy. It's a big problem, but hey, like uh, Mr. Clayton said, it's a work in progress. So. Absolutely, Jorge. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to meet another student now, 14-year-old Kavya Venkatesan from Old Bridge, New Jersey. Kaya, Kavya is a freshman at Old Bridge High School and involved in JA with the Women's Future Leadership Series Advisory Board. Kavya, go ahead with your question for the panel. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'm really honored and excited to be a part of this empowering conversation. This summit is definitely the step towards the right direction for a more equitable and successful tomorrow for all young students. We are in a digital age where everything around us is changing at an exponential rate. We are constantly seeing new technology, new industry trends, and new barriers being broken. This means that as students enter the workforce, they will need to continuously adapt to these changing conditions and learn new things quickly. How can today's teens develop that adaptive mindset and prepare for the future of work? Absolutely, great question. You know, Gorak, you are a JA alum. I'm sure that so much has changed with technology from the days that you were in the Toronto chapter. What would be your advice for Kavya? Kavya, you're totally right. The world is changing and it's changing quickly. The jobs that were stable yesterday are no longer the jobs that are stable today. The jobs that are stable today won't be the same jobs that will be stable in the future. And so when there's so much change happening so quickly, it's helpful to think like a venture capitalist. What's a venture capitalist? It's someone who takes money and invests it in ideas, entrepreneurs, and businesses that they believe will be successful in the future. How do they know this? They don't have a crystal ball. They're normal people, just like you and me. What they do do, though, is they're learning voraciously. So they're going out there, meeting lots of people, following the news, trying new products and services. And most importantly, they're taking all of these data points and they're putting it in their heads and they're synthesizing this information and they're forcing themselves to come up with a point of view. They're asking themselves, given what I'm seeing, what does the future hold? What does this mean for my businesses? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for my career? And so my charge to you, Kavya, is to think like a venture capitalist. Put yourself out there, meet new people, read the news, watch the news, try out new things. And most importantly, force yourself into getting a point of view. It's not easy because in school, we're often memorizing facts more so than thinking for ourselves. But thinking for yourself is exactly what's needed to, insert, to navigate this uncertainty. Absolutely true. And talking to as many people as possible to get your ideas together and be able to present them is also key. But Kavya, I know you're already on a great start for that. Thanks for joining us. I want to head to the Midwest now, uh, where Tiffany Lee is a senior at Bettendorf High School in Iowa. She will be attending St. Ambrose University next year with a dance team scholarship. Congratulations to you, Tiffany, on that, and thank you for joining us. What's your question for the panel? Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. My question for today is, what should be encouraged to lower the unemployment rate? That is a great question for an economist. Dr. Cook, what's your answer? I, because we're talking to junior achievement, I have a, a really innovative, but not so new uh, way to address this, starting businesses. Now you might say, and not everybody can, I, I understand that, but we have seen business starts hit record highs during this pandemic. So I am going to just go with what is already happening and say, if, if one could, and people are doing this, one should try to start the business that one might have had 
in the back of one's head, say from high school or uh, even from elementary school. The other thing to address it is not just to start a stop at starting a business because most businesses actually don't hire people, but plan to hire people. How can you spread the wealth? How can you involve other people in your business? How can you achieve your goals with other people? So this is one thing that you could do to address the unemployment rate. And this is something that governments could do as well. Make it easier to start businesses, support those uh, small businesses, support them with infrastructure, with resources. So this is one thing that one could do to address the unemployment rate. Dr. Cook, I have to ask you, I know you started a business as a teenager. Were you thinking about the unemployment rate when you did that or what was your business and, and why did you start it? I was not thinking about the unemployment rate. That's uh, absolutely true. Uh, but I was thinking about fighting boredom, actually. I had a chemistry class and I was getting bored in it. And my mom said, so why don't you come up with some problem sets and work on this on your own? And I did. And what I was really interested in was yeast. And I started doing these experiments with yeast, started uh, becoming experiments with bread. And then this became a business. I had a cooking school and I had a camp for kids. And I think that it was just the most uh, complete way to channel my creativity, to engage my mind and to work with other people. I learned so much in doing that exercise early in my life. And I think this is what planted a seed for me to become an economist. That's amazing, that's amazing. Tiffany, thank you very much for your question. I appreciate it. Um, I wanna go now, we're still talking about entrepreneurship, of course. Bryce Stevens joins us from Upper Marlboro, Maryland. He's a senior at CMIT Academy North High School. And Bryce, what is your question for us today? Hello, my question today is, what is the most important lesson that you've learned in entrepreneurship and how does it continue to help you today? Natalie, that sounds like a great question for you. What are your thoughts there? Uh, you know, my the most important lesson for me, I'm an investor now, one of those people that Gork was just talking about. Um, and what I learned prior to becoming an investor and then with working, obviously, with the capital side of things is that people pay attention when what you're doing is fundamentally solving a real problem, right? Um, and what we learned, especially, look, in the last year, Bryce, I mean, what companies survived and what companies didn't, right? And even what we determined to be essential sort of changed, right? One of the things that many of us realized is that art is essential. Those movies that kept us, kept us through quarantine are essential, right? We might not have thought of that five, you know, ten years ago. And so ultimately what we need to be doing is rooting, and this is the tip that I guess became the most critical for me, root every entrepreneurial idea that you have on a problem that you're actually solving and a problem that ideally people, you and other people around you are really passionate about. Yeah, Natalie, you launched your first tech startup. You were just 20 years old. What was the problem that you were trying to solve at that time? <laughs> at the time, I was trying to solve the problem of having a bum knee and a bum wrist from a motorcycle accident and realizing that I couldn't tell my parents that I had even owned a motorcycle. I couldn't afford a car. So I went to the nearest car dealership and I offered to trade a website for a car. And to my surprise, he said yes. And then a few other people said yes. The next thing you know, I had a web development company on my hands. That's amazing. That is amazing. You know, you also are very active on social media, Natalie. I know Gork is too. And I want to encourage the students to do that, to be on LinkedIn. You all are, have a resume already for sure. Um, and you need to ha let us know who you are and find out what other people are doing who are interested in what you're doing. So Bryce, uh, I, I encourage you, but I know you're already on LinkedIn because people are already reaching out to me saying you were going to be here today. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. I want to get to the next student that we have who I met just a few weeks ago and I feel like I've known her forever. Her name is Zoe McCall. She's from Brandywine, Maryland. She's a high school sophomore at the Academy of Health Sciences at Prince George's County Community College. And I interviewed Zoe earlier this month for a CNBC story that I was doing on students advocating for financial education in their schools. Zoe testified in front of her region's school board and advocating to make sure that there will be a requirement for a personal finance class for high school graduation. 
And believe it or not, that resolution passed. And Zoe, who is the class of 2023, like my daughter, will be taking that personal finance course before she graduates, which is just so exciting to me. Zoe, thanks so much for being here today. And what is your question for the panel? Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here because the information that we're getting today is priceless. I am an adamant advocate for financial literacy as a graduation requirement for everyone. So my question is, what do you guys think an average financial literacy class should look like? That is a great question. Lisa, let's start with you, Dr. Cook. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You may have already created a curriculum for it. <laughs> so get ready for the list. So there is budgeting and not just simple budgeting, but multi-year so that you understand what has to be planned for in the future. So an annual budget, a monthly budget, an annual budget, a three-year budget, and one that takes you from high school to college and then through college, because you look at the decisions that you'll be making in the future, and then you change your behavior now. So that I think is, is absolutely critical. I would include investing, uh, basic knowledge of investing, basic knowledge of present value, and future value, how your savings grow just by them sitting there, your savings just sitting there. Um, I would also, if you are in a, a certain neighborhood where there are payday lenders uh, and check cashers, I would inform myself of how much more this costs than other alternatives, right? So this is a prevalent problem. Um, I would also like in that class, uh, more information about starting a business. How do you do that? This can be mysterious. So I think that JA is uh, definitely contributing to that, but that should be part of a class. This is a traditional way to the middle class and everybody ought to be encouraged to do so, even if they may not wind up doing so. Absolutely right, absolutely right. Gorak, I want to bring you in here because I think career planning is so important. And I teach a class at Columbia University for graduate students on professional development where we talk about resumes and interviewing. Um, and at that point, to be starting your resume and trying to figure that out, I feel like it's really late. I mean, these students already have, many of them have businesses. They have a lot of organizations they're involved in. How important is career planning to financial education in high school? Oh, it's so important, and I'm so thrilled, Zoe, that you're doing the work that you're doing. You're going to be impacting millions of teens across the United States and around the world, so keep up the great work. Career planning, I would love for this to be part of the curriculum as early as possible. So many students are pursuing higher education without a sense of where they want to end up. And so having this type of education and this type of dialogue early on is essential. While Dr. Cook was introducing a list, I'd love to add my own list. I know you're, you're, you've got a long list already, uh, but my list is, is one of thinking about what is financial literacy all about in the first place. And in my mind, it's all about asking three questions or being able to answer three questions well. One is how do you use what you have to make more money? Two is how do you spend less money than you earn? And number three, it's how do you make good decisions given multiple conflicting priorities? So when I think about this ideal financial literacy curriculum, I'd love to see three units where unit one is how do you make money? Unit two is how do you spend money wisely? And unit three is how do you navigate life's big decision points? I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that too. I'd love to see that too. Natalie, let me bring you in because I think you actually did that already with the curriculum at Barnard in trying to help women understand how to make money and become entrepreneurs. Can you talk a little bit about what you would have in a financial literacy class in high school or what you would bring from what the curriculum you already created into high schools across the country? Yeah, and I would just say, Zoe, I know that you know the magnitude of what you've accomplished, but I want to reiterate that in the program that I created at Barnard at Columbia University, which is a pre-college program, the majority of the students that come in for what is effectively a startup boot camp over the summer have never taken a financial literacy class. And so the fact that you are starting to push that way forward so that students like that can actually come through the door already kind of having a basic knowledge, it's huge. You are giving a massive advantage to a lot of kids. And I just want to say thank you. 
Um, the thing that I found is exactly what Dr. Cook was saying, is that financial literacy and entrepreneurship are inextricably connected. The two cannot be separated. And I think that the thing that I have found to be most effective is to root the different examples that are being provided for us to talk about and for us to model in real life scenarios. What I find is that Teens especially are already really, really savvy about finding discounts and not paying for shipping and figuring out what, which websites they can buy things the cheapest. That same kind of curiosity and hacking spirit of not just settling with what, you know, settling for what you're handed, but actually figuring out a way to sort of work the system and find cheaper ways to get from point A to point B is a skill that teenagers always come into the door already having and building financial fluency on top of those skills I have found to be the most effective way to make sure that whatever we're teaching sticks. Absolutely, absolutely. Jake, let me bring you in too. Um, the SEC certainly has financial literacy programs and partners with a number of organizations uh, on this initiative, but what do you think should be in an actual high school personal finance class. What are the key points? Well, let me add my congratulations to Zoe. Uh, terrific what you've done. And, and you know what you're doing? You're putting yourself out there. And, and that is part of financial literacy. It's part of being an entrepreneur, putting yourself out there, taking risks. And you've clearly done that. And others are going to be rewarded for it. So congratulations on that, Zoe. Um, I like what all my fellow panelists have said. Real world problems, tangible problems, to get to what I would say is a broader issue that I, I think we all understand, but I'm just going to say it, which is financial decision making is a part of every day, whether it's buying things, looking for discounted shipping and the like, but credit, saving for tomorrow. It's something that should be part of your mindset every day, and we should all get comfortable with the fact that it's part of our mindset every day. I think starting in high school with the class that conveys that message is extremely important. So Zoe, thanks again. Absolutely. Zoe, you've gotten a lot of praise here, but I have to ask you why. Why did you decide to advocate for financial education in your schools? And why do you think it's important for students to do it? All of us have been active in trying to advocate for financial education throughout our careers, but you're starting while you're still in it. So you can still benefit from it. Why did you decide to become an advocate? I decided to advocate for financial literacy myself because I have really big goals and I'm already an entrepreneur now. So as an entrepreneur, as a freshman, as a sophomore in high school, I'm kind of learning as I go. Whereas if there are these classes in place for middle schoolers and high schoolers to take before they go that route, before they start their businesses, they'll go into their businesses one step ahead, knowing exactly what to do, what to avoid, the correct decision to make, and they'll just have all the knowledge before so they don't have to learn like as they go, like I do. And I feel like it's important for people of all ages to have this access, um, to have access to this class at their schools. Because like I said, it's really important as we get older, as we go to college, and as we take out our student loans and start a career, it's important to have all this under our belt so we can make the correct decisions to go great places in life. That's fantastic, Zoe. So great to see you again. And I'm so excited that we're having this event and making connections because now you're going to meet someone from Arizona who wanted to do and did just what you did. I hope that you all connect offline. Please meet Ella Hamer. Ella Hamer is 16 years old. She's one of Junior Achievement Arizona's 18 under 18 award recipients this year. She earned this recognition through her work with Girl Scouts and her work with the Arizona State Treasurer to pass financial education legislation. She even testified in front of the state Senate. So here we have another powerful advocate for financial education, just 16 years old. Ella, thank you for joining us and thank you for your advocacy. What is your question for the panel? Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So I'm going to be a senior next year. And my question is, what is the most important thing for students to know about their personal finances before graduating high school and making decisions regarding college? Jay, let me bring you in here to answer that question. Uh, I, I, I really think that just understanding credit, the cost of credit, um, and, and minimizing the interest rates that you're paying, really shopping around, that I think is, is something so important because Look, student loans, the cost of education, it's one of the biggest expenses people will have. And understanding how to, how to finance that as inexpensively as possible is really important. 
Absolutely great advice, great advice. I wanna bring in Sophia now. Sophia, Sha Sophia Zhao is joining us now from Dulles High School in Sugarland, Texas. She's the CEO of a junior achievement startup that's fighting plastic pollution, and it's called Delicious Co. Dulles, delicious, get it? Great idea, great title. Love, love, love the name of your company. Um, Sophia, what is your question for the panelists today? Hello, I am so excited and grateful for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. My question is, what processes can we implement to change the narrative that entrepreneurship is too unstable of a career pathway for students? This could open up more gateways for students to succeed in life, even without a college degree, and assist in breaking generational poverty. Gorek, you are the expert on starting off careers, right? That is the, what you wrote in your book. What would be your answer for Sophia? Well, first off, Sophia, I'm so grateful. I'm so excited to be meeting you here today. So thank you for your question. When it comes to entrepreneurship, you're totally right. It is unstable. But it raises the question of unstable compared to what? I was nerding out over this, this morning over breakfast on the US Bureau of Labor Statistics website. It's not a pastime I have frequently, but I was nerding out on that website and I found an interesting table where I found the jobs that are in most decline from 2019 to 2029. And I was looking at the top 15 professions and I saw examples like travel agent, like administrative assistant, like data entry clerk. And I started thinking to myself, wow, these were stable, fantastic careers just a few years ago, just a few decades ago. That's no longer going to be the case and it's not going to be the case going forward. Which then raises the question of, is anyone going to be immune to this change that's ahead of us? In which case, entrepreneurship sounds a lot like taking on that risk and that uncertainty versus maybe delegating that uncertainty over to the CEO of your company to manage and collecting a paycheck and doing a specific role in that particular enterprise. And so when I think about risk, it doesn't seem like any of us are going to be immune to, to the uncertainty that's ahead of us. When it comes to the, 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 the process of potentially reducing this risk for people, I think of what venture capitalists can do, what schools can do, and what governments can do, where venture capitalists can do a better job of investing in ideas, people, and startups that are outside of their immediate social circles. That would spread the wealth and would create a lot more jobs in communities that have great ideas, but just don't have access to that capital. When it comes yeah. to what schools could be doing more of, I, I would love to see schools encourage more entrepreneurship so that students are starting early. And then when it comes to what governments can be doing, so much of this uncertainty comes from not being able to pay the bills if there is a shock to your finances all of a sudden. So what can governments do when it comes to healthcare policy, for example, to make sure that that shock isn't so shocking when it comes? Gork, I'm looking down because the questions keep coming here and I wanna make sure that we get to all of them. But first, you know, you're talking to an entrepreneur, of course, already. And Sophia, I love the name of your company, but I love what it's about. Can you please show us what you're doing with Delicious? Thank you so much. So Delicious Co. sells beeswax wraps and think of this as plastic wrap. It stores leftovers, wraps sandwiches, packs snacks. But the good thing about this is that it's reusable for over a year. So all you have to do is just rinse off any food residue with cold water and you can use it again and again for food storage. And what did you say it's made from? So it's a cotton fabric coated in a mixture of food grade beeswax, plant resin, and jojoba oil. And we just wanted to give a more sustainable alternative to commonly used plastic wraps. That is fantastic. I, I know my daughter's gonna want that one for sure. No more, the next two years of high school, she's gonna have that for her wrap for her sandwiches. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. We have an eighth grader joining us now. Ashley Nevison is a JA Young Ambassador from Phoenix. And she's been involved with JA since elementary school. She's working hard in her community to provide hope for the less fortunate. And Ashley has an important question for the panel. I am in eighth grade and I run my own 501c3. I'm learning new things every single day that are not being covered in school to help run my business. What outside activities and experiences should I be focusing on to help? And when I go to high school next year, what classes should I be focusing on taking outside a business class that you think would help? 
Natalie, investor, entrepreneur, author, educator, you are the perfect person to answer this one. I wish I had things quite that figured out in eighth grade. Ashley, how impressive. Um, you know, I feel like you're already at, you know, such an advanced level. I don't even know where to begin, but here's what I would say. And it's a little bit unorthodox, but take it from me. This is the way to differentiate both yourself and your educational path. Um, what you need as an entrepreneur and what you need to be successful in business is to be able to adapt, to be able to improvise, to be able to be creative. So it might seem a little odd, but here's my advice. Do all of the things that allow you to exercise those muscles. If that means taking an improv class, that is one of the most rewarding and frankly productive things you can do for being a wonderful entrepreneur. Help you figure out how to move on your feet, shift when things change, Athletics are an amazing way to learn how to build teams and collaborate with others, which you must be as a leader in business. These are the sort of things that don't seem off the top of your head like they are focused on business, but they're probably the biggest and most important things you can do for educating yourself and sort of exercising those muscles of being an entrepreneur. I love that, Natalie, because there's so much focus on plan, 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 follow this path, follow this path. And to think outside the box and, and really explore your passions is so important. I hope that was helpful to you. All right, thanks for joining us. The next person that we have asking a question is Alexia McKitty, and she's from Vestal, New York. She's graduating this year, plans to study communications at Ithaca College, and she also plays soccer. The past year, she won 2021 Entrepreneurial Youth Summit Award for her work in the JA Senior Company Program, and she also recently earned her gold award from the Girl Scouts. There are so many accomplishments. I was trying to get them all out succinctly there for you, Alexia. What's your question? Hello, everyone. So my question today is, is minimizing the pay gap something that seems achievable in the next decade? Wow, I love that question. Dr. Cook, what is your answer? Absolutely. Absolutely, in the next decade, there are things that could be done immediately. Employers have a lot of agency. They can address this issue. So first of all, they can start paying everybody the same if they are doing the same work. So this is a big part of the wage gap. Then employers can recruit and develop the talent, hire and develop the same talent that is uh, developed in a fair way. My research shows that patent teams, for example, are more productive when they are diverse. So you're leaving money on the table, employers are leaving money on the table if they're not using these diverse teams, if they're not hiring and putting people in these jobs as diverse teams. Managers could do more to get women and underrepresented minorities into these jobs. Employees could also provide child care and medical leave, parental leave, uh, other types of leave so that women especially are not penalized for working, for being ambitious, uh, for taking off time to have uh, children. So some of these things can be done uh, over time. They may take a little bit of time, but some of these can be done right away. So I certainly believe that we can move towards move aggressively towards closing uh, the wage gap, no matter how you define it, uh, in the near future over the next decade. That is so encouraging, Dr. Cook. Thank you very much. I, you know, Alexia, you're already you know, on your way with what you're working on, and you have a real purpose for studying communications next year. It's a very personal one. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and your story? Yes, so I play soccer, um, but I was born without my right hand. So growing up, my parents never let that be a reason to slow me down in life or be a limitation. So I kept that in mind, and my goal, ultimate goal in life is to try and minimize the divide our society has created between athletes with and without disabilities and kind of focus in on what is holding athletes with disabilities back from crossing over and competing and playing at the level of those who do not have a disability. Sort of like what I did, I play on a team with everyone with two hands and it doesn't hold me back. So I wanna see how I can create opportunity for those similar to my situation. 
That's fantastic. And you're going to continue to play soccer at Ithaca, right? Yep. I'll be playing on their women's soccer team for the next four years. That is fantastic. I mean, you just showed uh, many employers around the country and around the world how important inclusion is and what inclusion really means. It is so much broader than some are taking it. And I really appreciate you being here and joining us and sharing your story. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you. The next person I want to introduce you to is Gavin Williams, who is a senior at Hoover High School in North Canton, Ohio, and he currently serves as CEO of a financial literacy startup through Junior Achievement called Finlit. Gavin, what's your question for us today? Oh, if we didn't know, it's right behind you. Of course there. Finlit. That's your company. What's your question? Yeah, thank you for having me. So choosing a college is one of the most important decisions teens make. With the average student debt rising every year, what's your advice to better prepare teens for college financially? Gorik, what do you think is the answer there? When it comes to making smart financial decisions for college, I've got four tips. Number one, if you qualify for financial aid, apply to every need blind school that you're qualified for. Number two, apply to every merit-based and need-based scholarship that you qualify for. Number three, when you're deciding between schools and programs, pick the school and program that has a history of sending people into the jobs, into the companies, into the industries that you're most interested in. And finally, number four, is if you're going to be taking on debt, especially large amounts of debt, make sure you have line of sight to paying it off. That's a key point, a very key point. And I think perhaps one that you're already working on with Finlit. Tell us a little bit about your company. Yeah, so Finlit creates products that are designed to teach kids financial literacy. Our mission is to instill financial literacy in every child and empower them with the skills they need for a successful future. And our product is Budget or Bust. It's a board game designed to teach kids financial literacy. Um, we did a demo at a, our local middle school in front of 40 kids in a financial literacy class. They absolutely loved it. And since launch, we've sold in over 13 states. Um, it's been a huge success. That's fantastic. Congratulations to you on that. Definitely a product that we like to look at more. I want to get to our next student, Bradley Longcar. He's 18 years old, and he's coming to us all the way from Anchorage, Alaska. Bradley, thank you so much for joining us. You're going to be graduating soon, and so congratulations on that as well. What's your question? Hi, welcome from uh, the cold heartland of uh, Alaska. Uh, all I have for the, the panel today is, uh, do you think it is more valuable for me to go to college to get a degree, or do you should I value getting more hands-on experience from the workforce instead? Wow, what do you think, Natalie? What would be your advice? Why not both? <laughs> Listen, um, Bradley, I, you're talking to somebody who's had a pretty diverse experience in that camp. I went to college a little bit ahead of schedule, um, which uh, I think a lot of people get excited about. But then once I was in college, I didn't feel like it was, or at least the college I chose wasn't the one for me. I ended up changing colleges about four different times before I ultimately started my very first startup and dropped out. Later in life, in my 30s, I craved going back to that sort of an environment. I craved that sort of constant learning and place of curiosity. And so even though I was 14 years into a successful career in tech startups, I ended up going back to college. I went to an Ivy League school. Um, I studied at Columbia University and I have zero regrets. And so I've been away done both. And I would say, you know, there are example after example of people who made it happen in either scenario. And it's a really personal choice. I think about Kat Cole. She was the CEO of Cinnabon. She's one of my closest friends. She then became the COO of the parent company that owned Cinnabon and Auntie Anne's and Carvel's and Jamba Juice. And she did it, guess what? Without a bachelor's degree. But once she got enough work experience, she actually went to Georgia Tech and she convinced them to let her into their MBA program. So I want to say, Bradley, it's just that there isn't one formula. You can pick, choose, you can do both, you can do a little bit of both. Um, at the end of the day, it's what feels right for you. And it's there's absolutely no harm in trying something, deciding it doesn't work, and then trying something else. My Goldilocks college experience didn't hold me back. In fact, I think it helped. Excellent right. advice. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Thank you. You know, we have just over 20 minutes left to get through a lot of questions from our teens. And so we're going to keep it moving with our panel here and get to Fadila Passmore. She is an active junior achievement participant in Westminster, Colorado. And Fadila, go ahead with your question. 
Hello, so my question is, what are successful ways to help students with their personal finances in high school so that regardless of their current situation, they can be successful? Dr. Cook, what's your answer? I would piggyback on what I was saying before, and that is thinking about multi-year planning and multi-year budgeting. When I had my cooking school, um, I was thinking about college. So now you all are gonna laugh. I made 30 cents a week. I made 30 cents a week. And this is, and I wasn't born in the 1800s. I just <laughs> want you to know. Uh, so, so I had to figure out how I was gonna save for myself, spending for myself and for the cooking school. So I just, I pinched my pennies. I put in my budget what I was gonna get in gifts every year. What, you know, and, and now it's a lot easier because you have gift cards. I put a lot of things on layaway. So layaway is something that is coming back. You um, purchase something by putting a down payment on it and the store keeps it and you just go back. I think I probably went back weekly or monthly and um, paid something on it and then uh, got it. And I think that that was something that helped me with multi-year planning and made me conscious of the decisions I needed to make to be able to afford the kind of education that I wanted in the future or the kind of business I wanted to have in the next year or in the future. So I think that's one thing that multi-year budgeting is something that would be really helpful for students. I think so too, I think so too, definitely. Thank you for joining us. I, I wanna bring in 18 year old Safa Chowdhury of Sugarland, Texas, a senior at William P. Clements High School. Safa, what's your question? Hello, thank you so much for having me. My question would be, how can we help engage the public education system and alter them to help the, the youth make better financial decisions and manage their investments? Great question, Gorak, what's your take? Yeah, it, it, it blows my mind that we spend more time talking about the quadratic equation in school than we do about compound interest. And when it comes to my career, at least, I have not used the quadratic equation once, not that it's not important, but I haven't used it as many times as I've used compound interest when it comes to my retirement account and when it comes to my own personal habits and how small decisions every day can compound over time to make big outcomes happen. And so when I think about improving the, the, the financial literacy of the next generation in terms of improving the education system more broadly, I'd love to see theoretical math become more practical math. I'd love to see more textbook learning become practical learning. I'd love to see more memorization become problem solving. I'd love to see those happen in our school system. Yeah, and I think Safa probably would like that as a student too, right? Excellent. Yes. Thanks for joining us. Joshua Fink, let me get to you from Chaparral High School in Paradise Valley, Arizona. Paradise Valley, Arizona sounds beautiful right now because it is about 37 degrees in New York. Joshua, what's your question for the panel? Hello, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, so with so many young adults not having fundamental skills in money management, what can the schooling system do to make the next generation more financially literate? Jay, you've talked about your passion for making sure that financial habits start very early and that decision-making is taught very early. What would be your answer here for Joshua? Well, well, I think we heard this from, from some of my fellow panelists, which is incorporating real-world decision-making in the math class, in the science class. Let's, let's talk in the math class about compound interest and also the, the types of decisions that you make over time as Dr. Cook was pointing out, what it means today, tomorrow, 10 years down the road. Real quickly, um, look, the other thing is, let's learn about entrepreneurship in science. I mean, one of the great strengths this country has is our techno technological advantage and the companies we've created. Let's learn about how those companies were created so people understand that it can be done. Excellent, I hope that's helpful to you. You know, we have a, a great representation of students today from the Grand Canyon State, and we have another person that I'm anxious for you all to meet, 18-year-old Jimena Camacho from Vail, Arizona. And what is your question for the panel today? Hi, my question for the panel today is what prompts a wage difference and what can individuals do to help bridge that gap? Oh, that's the economist question there for Dr. Cook. What do you say? 
I, I will just reiterate the answer that I gave earlier that, first of all, one has to articulate what kind of wage gap we're talking about. Are we talking about a uh, women's wage gap or wage gap, a uh, black-white wage gap? One has to uh, articulate exactly what that is. And then um, one has to ask the employers why they are paying the same people for the same work differently. Why are they paying them differently? So I think the onus is on the employers. There's only so much you can do. You can ask, say, as a woman, we know from research, you can ask for a higher raise. But if, you, if you're caught uh, asking for more pay, sometimes you're called too ambitious or you're called too aggressive. And that doesn't always work. So I would put the onus first on the employers to pay people equally for equal work. Excellent, excellent. Makes perfect sense. Not always done, but makes perfect sense to me. Um, I wanna bring in now 17-year-old Jelani Foster, who is joining us from South San Francisco, California. And Jelani, what's your question? Hi everyone, I hope you're doing amazing today. I am so honored and thankful to be having this opportunity to talk with you all today and have this discussion. To start off, as a new generation of students are growing, flourishing, and empowering right before our own eyes, many of us have dreams or ideas but don't know where to start or put our first, first foot forward. What would you advise young dreamers like us to think of, have a mindset or strength of, before making our own nonprofit or business from scratch. So my first take is that your energy is just fabulous. And if you impart that in whatever you do, I think you're gonna go far. I already feel more relaxed. Maybe because I said you're from South San Francisco and I'm thinking Zen or something because of where you, where you come from, but it's just the way you present already you know, makes me want to listen and think about it. And Natalie, you know, there's so much I know that you've taught in that pre-college class at Barnard for young entrepreneurs, but what would your advice be to Jelani? You know, I think you're right, Sharon, energy is everything. Uh, start, you know, let's start there. I think beyond that, we need to be thinking about building building blocks and confidence, right? Um, one of the things that I loved about what Dr. Cook said when asked the question of, can we bridge, for example, the wage gap within 10 years, just as an example, right? Um, Dr. Cook, I think, gave us a really um, encouraging answer that, yeah, absolutely, it's possible. I would piggyback off of that and just say, it's possible, but not if we follow the standard rules that say you've got to do A, B, C, D, exactly in that order, right? We've got to embrace the idea that, for example, the World Economic Forum says that women will re um, achieve parity in nearly 200 years at the rate that we're at. So if we go with the standard rules of operation, that's how long it's going to take. And so in order for us to make that 10-year you know, ambitious goal that Dr. Cook, I think, just enlisted all of us to get on board with, it means embracing the idea that we cannot follow the old rules. We've got to make our own rules. And we cannot be shy about taking shortcuts. We cannot be shy about being bold and walking into rooms like we own the place because we must. And the energy that you bring to the question that you asked and the energy that you even just brought into this is the sort of energy that we need. You need to just walk in, like I said, like you own the place and like you are entitled to what is coming to you and your generation, which is a whole lot of what other generations skipped, right? We, if we don't make it right with your generation, then we're never gonna make it right. And people like you um, and people who walk in with that sort of confidence are the ones that are gonna lead the way. Absolutely right, absolutely right. And the leadership programs are so very important. I wanna go now from California to Kentucky to introduce you all to a junior, Pragya Upredi, and she is part of the Leadership Lexington Youth Program. Pragya, what is your question? Hi, so first of all, first of all, I just wanted to say that I'm so honored and, you know, inspired to be here with so many incredible young people and, of course, um, such empowering individuals from all across our country today. Um, and I was just curious to know what potential does technology have within our public schools and bridging the digital divide that's really exacerbated in the midst of COVID-19 um, and more specifically distance learning where so many students across our country haven't had access to technology to learn in the midst of a crisis. 
Gorak, what would you say to that as you're seeing students coming in to your university and, and what impact that digital divide is having? Pragya, you're totally right. It's been awful seeing and hearing stories of students who've been having to camp outside of coffee shops just so they can get access to Wi-Fi to attend class. And to your point, technology is both a solution, but it's also the challenge. It's the solution because if you don't have a laptop in 2021, you're going to be missing out on a lot of great opportunities that can only be accessed through the web. At the same time, a laptop is kind of like the faucet in your kitchen. You need it, but it's not gonna be a useful faucet unless you've got water flowing through that faucet. And in 2021, it's incredible and it's a real shame that there's this big divide between higher income areas and lower income areas when it comes to access to the internet, as well as between rural areas and urban areas. And so technology is the solution, but it's also the challenge because we need to expand Wi-Fi access, internet access to people so that they don't just have a faucet where we need to have everyone having a faucet in the form of a laptop, a digital device, but we also need to make sure that people have running water, which is really the internet in 2021. And it's gonna be difficult because we need to give people access, but this is also a matter of policy. And so when you, from a short time from now, Pragya, are running for public office and are looking for our votes, I hope that this will be at top of your agenda. Great advice, great advice. Thank you, Gorak. And thank you for being for your question, Pragya. Appreciate that. We wanna move now back to Texas. Uh, we wanna meet, to me, Tommy Lola Oganola. Tommy Lola Oganola is a student at Harmony School of Innovation, and she credits JA with unearthing her entrepreneurial spirit. Tommy Lola, what's your question? Hi, I just wanna say I'm so grateful to be here today. I just wanna say thank you to all the judges for listening. So my question is, personal finance education has become almost necessary at high school to bridge the racial wealth gap that is prevalent in society. Education, after all, is a great equalizer. For minority status teenagers like myself who are trying to better save and invest and are also starting new businesses, what advice do you have? So, Lisa, what advice do you have, Dr. Kip, for that one? I think that you have to be aware of where a lot of the biases are, for example, in lending. So you might want to start an account at a credit union now because there are uh, there's much more support for small businesses at uh, credit unions, local uh, local banks, but you have to be aware of these differences going in. Now, I am giving that advice to you as a person in junior achievement. Our generation has got to work on something else. The structural issues that keep large financial institutions from investing in businesses that young people start or that anyone starts. So for example, home appraisals, we know, are racially biased. And this can mean a large, large gap in wealth. So this is what typically uh, lending is based on. Your being able to borrow is based on. So we'll work on that. You work on making sure that you are seeking out an institution that will support your small business. Excellent advice, excellent advice. I wanna bring in Lauren now. Lauren, at you been, I Sorry, Lauren. Lauren Etty Ben Anson is now here from Rockville, Maryland. And Lauren, what is your question for the panel? Hi, I would like to ask, what are ways that people can get better experience or better, better experience with their personal finances? Jay, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I wanna go back to a couple things. Let's get connected early and let's try it out. Having a bank account, just like Dr. Cook just said, getting exposed to a credit union, just experiencing what it is to have savings, have interest compound, real tangible things. And I'm, I'm a big advocate for this being part of everybody's life growing up. Tangible experience with our financial system, because if you're not connected to our financial system, you're on the outside and it's much more difficult. So. You know, yes, as a public policy matter, but as a personal matter, try and, try and get connected in a practical way as soon as possible. Excellent, I hope that was helpful, Lauren. Thanks for joining us. 
Um, Faustino Martinez is joining us from Houston, Texas. We had to sneak in another person from Texas, Faustino. You're a junior at Heights High School. Faustino, what's your question? Hi, so it is with my understanding that a lot of minority owned businesses have issues getting small business loans, despite being a large percentage of the businesses owned within the country. So my question is, how can we facilitate a process that would encourage minority owned businesses to thrive, especially under a climate of economic strain like we have now? Natalie, it's such an issue. We report about it all the time on CNBC. What is your advice? What are your thoughts? Well, first, and this is my personal preference, you don't have to listen to me, Faustino, <laughs> but people of color represent 70% of the Earth's population. I have stopped using the term minority. Um, and I think that it comes also with a mindset, right? Women, for example, are starting twice the are starting businesses at twice the rate of men in the United States. And of those businesses, 8.9 out of 10 of them are started by women of color. So you're absolutely right. We are not outliers. We are not exceptions. We are actually the majority of the entrepreneurial spirit in this country. Um, and I go back to, you know, maybe uh, Dr. Cook's approach, right? There's sort of what we want you to focus on and then there's what we are gonna focus on. Um, the older generations have to focus on holding these banks and these large financial institutions accountable. Just in this last week, and I hope that you look this up, Faustino, because it's an, it's an amazing story that many of my colleagues were involved in, as was I. Um, an organization, as with many, many banks, got on the bandwagon and decided to make a pledge to stop financing private prisons. One of them was Barclays Bank. And they thought that the public would forget that a year later, last month, they decided to fund a private bank, a private prison, excuse me. Um, of course, we didn't forget. A number of us got together and we held them accountable and we made a fuss and we talked about the fact that they had made a pledge and now it seemed like they were going back on it. We ended up costing them $200 million in one day and they spent a few days deliberating over whether or not they would even proceed with this investment and a few days ago, they opted to bow out entirely from the investment. This is the sort of thing that we can all do so that people like you can continue to, to do what communities of color are doing and what immigrant communities especially are really, really good at doing, which is starting businesses. And then you're right, getting the sort of financing that they need to be able to thrive. I want you to just so think important. about starting the businesses. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what Faustino, you know, is all about with JA and so many of our teams, Natalie, have been doing. And in the final minutes we have, I just have to thank you, Natalie, and our panelists for your excellent insights uh, in answering these students' questions. But most important, I want to thank you teens for paying attention to what you're doing in your school and making it better and making a real change in our community, in our society, in our world. And I have to thank as well the leader of Junior Achievement for making this all happen, and that's Jack Osakowski. Jack, please come back and uh, tell us a little bit more about why you think today was such an incredible event, because I know you do, just like I do. Well, thank you, Sharon, and thanks to all the panelists. I mean, talk about a wealth of knowledge to share with the kids. And I, I hope you can see how advanced these students are. And these kids were young people that were involved in junior achievement. The students that don't get that experience are really challenged. And I think what we all have to remember as parents, uh, as educators, is we need to meet the students where they are with their current level of knowledge and not scare them away with a whole bunch of theory. Let, let's start out where the kids are looking at investing in college education, buying their first car. And so very simple, but you can see how that, that approach works and the kind of results that you see with these young entrepreneurs, these young people that have just achieved remarkable accomplishments. Absolutely. It has been a re remarkable hour, I must say. I am just blown away. And I thank you, Jay Clayton. I thank you, Dr. Cook. Gorik Eng and Natalie Molina Nino, thank you all for being here. Thank you, students, for watching and telling your friends and sharing it on social media and making sure that everyone hears what these insightful panelists had to say, but also the insightful students that are your peers, what they had to say as well. And please join us for the next time, because, Jack, I want there to be a next time.
please join us again. I am Sharon Epperson for CNBC. You can find out a lot more information about, CN about what we're covering at cnbc.com slash invest in you. Thank you for joining us. Let's level the playing field together.